So that's a fun passage, <laughs> isn't it? Wow, boy, I was looking forward to this one. You know, this is one of those passages that pastors dodge all the time. Let me talk on Jesus welcoming the little children to himself. Those are fun. Uh, this is a challenge, isn't it? Because Jesus talks about take up your cross. Jesus talks about hating your family. What's that about? Jesus talks about counting the cost. And isn't that interesting when we're in the middle of a huge building project and, you know, we're going to be having a discussion about we probably are going to need a few more dollars to make this happen. You could say, well, Pastor, didn't you count the cost before you went and did that? Talk about salt losing it, and we're all talking about unless you give up everything, you can't be my disciple. So how do we make sense of this? One of the things that you should know as students of God's Word, as a people of the book, uh, it's so critical that we read the book, not simply read isolated verses here and there. For example, I don't know about you, think about it with your children or maybe with employees. It's really nice to get excuses, isn't it? Isn't it fun when you have something, an expectation, and then people come up with a whole list of excuses as to why they can't do that thing? Uh, we talked about this even with our high schoolers in chapel this week and talked about what kind of, with the teachers, what kind of excuses in the first two weeks have you already gotten from students on why they can't turn in their homework or why they can't keep their uniform tucked in or why they aren't able to complete this class or whatever it is. And, and the list of excuses uh, is, uh, is unending. They, they just... We all of us seem to be, and the older we get, I think even more expert at coming up with excuses. That's what immediately precedes this. And Jesus is a little bit tired of it. Jesus is frustrated with the level of excuses that he is getting from people. In fact, the story just before this was that great banquet in which the man, Jesus told the story. He says, this is what you people are all like. There's a great banquet. And God and the Master sent out a tremendous invitation to come to the great feast. Everything is now ready. You will, hear me, you will hear us say this as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Come for all has now been made ready. What a blessing. What an invitation. And then one after another. I got married. I bought a piece of property. I got a new car. I got a problem. I can't come. Can't come. And Jesus has, been, has heard enough. Jesus has heard enough. I would argue to say that Jesus is one of the worst salesmen in human history. If you were trying to sell this thing that Jesus is doing, you would not do it this way. Unless you hate your family. Unless you give up everything. Unless you take up a cross, which was the most horrifying indignity of the, of the age. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You cannot have any part of me. This is not a good sales technique. Uh, it's almost like, you know, if you go to someone and say, hey, you know, you want to buy a house? Every American wants to buy a house. Let me tell you what, what happens when you buy a house. Let me tell you all the costs. Let me tell you all the taxes. Let me tell you all the things that go along with how this happens. Or you want to buy a car. Let me tell you how you're going to have to take care of it. Let me tell you how you're going to have to have the resources to be able to do and so forth and so on or even college imagine if it went this way if you said to people well here let's go to college you're gonna work harder than you ever thought you're gonna go through sleepless nights if you want to get a, a great degree you want to get an advanced degree you're gonna have all-nighters you're gonna work at fast food restaurants to pay the bills you're gonna probably not have gas for your car or have to put in three dollars at a time for years you're gonna have to you know your friends might abandon you who would go to college? Except that Jesus says at the end, and I'm buying. I'm buying. And that's the different perspective that we have as opposed to Jesus' listeners at this time. Jesus is telling them the sacrifice before the cross. We actually have the great benefit of knowing the sacrifice before that it's been done, that it's been paid for. Jesus is describing to them the sacrifice before he accomplishes it. We live in the aftermath and we still struggle. 
You know, imagine, you know, it's funny, I, I'm starting new member class, or it's not really for new members. Anyway, that's a bad way to say that. Life in Christ, this examination of basic Christianity and what we believe as a church starts next Monday, not tomorrow, but next Monday. And inevitably, as you visit with folks who are new to you, we spend some time focusing on the wonderful things of our church, don't we? And we talk about the youth programs that we may have or the school that we have, and we do children's church, and we hope that the preaching is relevant and dynamic, and we use some technology that we hope is relevant and helpful. We have a warm and cool place to be able to be, a place of safety, a place where you're welcome, a place where you can build friendships and grow in your faith and learn about the Word of God. And isn't that wonderful? I mean, we don't typically go up to the person who visits for the first time and say, by the way, we're going to ask you to give money. We're going to ask you to invest in the work and the ministry. We're going to ask you to engage with people you might never have engaged with, with people who are hungry or perhaps homeless, people you don't even know who live in other countries and other communities. We may ask you to enter into the lives of people who are broken and experience brokenness yourself. We are going to call you sinners. That's good, isn't it? That's, that's attractive. We're going to do all of those things. You're going to spend more hours than you thought you would spend. You're going to invest more resources than you ever imagined you might. And it's all for the sake of one person and one cause, Jesus Christ. Boy, that's a sales pitch, isn't it? And yet today, interestingly, in modern Christianity, that has often kind of been the approach. Let's tell you of all the really cool things that we do. And we'll tell you about all the neat benefits that you get. I mean, it's almost like a sales pitch. Oh, by the way, if you experience those other things, we'll kind of help you through it, but we won't tell you about it ahead of time. Now, I hope those of you who have gone through these experiences with me and with Pastor Von Bush and in classes, we hope that we're a little more transparent than that. I mean, we try not to shy away from these spots, but we're also honest in saying these are difficult and challenging. I want to show a little video here. Take a couple minutes. That's neat. You may have seen it before. It's a little cartoon video. Why don't you see it? Am I at the point of no improvement? What are the death I still dwell in? I try to excel, but I feel no movement. Can I be free of this unreleasable sin? Never underestimate my Jesus. You're telling me that there's no hope I'm telling you you're wrong Never underestimate my Jesus But when the world around you crumbles He will be strong, He will be strong Possibilities Frustrated and tired Where do I go from here? Now I'm searching for The confidence I've lost so willingly Overcoming these obstacles Is overcoming my fears oh, oh. Never underestimate my Jesus You're telling me that there's no hope I'm telling you you're wrong Never underestimate my Jesus But when the world around you crumbles He will be strong, He will be strong I think I can't, I think I can't But I think you can, I think you can I think I can't, I think I can't But I think you can, I think you can Gather my insufficiencies and Place them in your hands Place them in your hands, place them in your hands. Never under. 
to meet my Jesus You're telling me that there's no hope I'm telling you you're wrong Never underestimate my Jesus But when the world around you crumbles He will be strong Never underestimate my Jesus You're telling me that there's no hope I'm telling you you're wrong Never underestimate my Jesus But when the world around you crumbles You will be strong, you will be strong I have a wall of crosses in my office. If you've visited me there, you've seen them. And I tell everyone who asks me about them, every one of those has a story. Um, I like that video. It's not perfect. I like it, though. If you ask me about the crosses in my office, none of those are my crosses. Those are all Jesus' crosses. No one carries their own cross. We either carry the cross of Christ or we carry no cross at all. Because it's Jesus who walks with us. I went into a store in Mexico once uh, when we were in Ensenada, and I was looking for a cross. I'm always on the hunt for those that express different things and remind me of those experiences. And a number of you have been so kind and given me crosses over the years. A wheat cross to a clay cross to... Uh, painted ones. Uh, Ryan and Alexis gave me one from their trip for doing their wedding. It's beautiful. Everyone has a story and reminds me of the cross of Jesus Christ, which was born for you and born for me. But I was in that store in Ensenada, and you know what? There's a great big sign on there. And you know what it said? All crosses half price. There are, point number one is there are no half price crosses. There are none, because there is, in fact, only one cross, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. I think we mistake this passage for great law, for great burden, and Jesus, I think, is prompting that to say, unless you take up your cross, your cross is what he says in the text, but his cross has become our cross. If it is not our cross, then its benefits are not ours. Just as we kneel at the altar rail here, unless his body and blood have become ours, we do not have his gifts. Jesus is not expecting you to pay for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ knows that can't be done. And yet he is longing for you to receive his cross upon which he hangs and which he bore on our behalf. And so in the first one, when Jesus says, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple, the tagline on this is, this is a first commandment matter. This is about Jesus first. And it's not about spending all your time in prayer or on your knees and contemplating Jesus and reading the Bible, you know, to the, dis you know, like every, every waking moment of every day. That is not what that's talking about. It is talking, however, that just like when you guys go hunting and you look through those crosshairs to try to sight your target so that you can be accurate and know exactly what you're doing and you can accomplish your goal and hit that target with precision, the cross is a crosshairs in our life. That as we look at our life, the moments of our life, in fact, when you're, I'm guessing that those that are really accomplished almost don't even notice that crosshair anymore. It becomes such second nature as you zone in on the target. Jesus Christ is longing for us to in that cross which Jesus bears, which Jesus hangs upon, he gives to us that we might see our lives through it. That's the goal. And folks, I know this personally. The more that I do that, 
instead of looking through my worries, my hurts, my wants, the things that I'm longing for, the goals I'm hoping to accomplish, when I stop and say, Jesus, what are your goals? What are your values? And I begin to look at people, our world, my daily tasks, everything in my life in a different way. That's what Jesus is talking about. No half price crosses. And in fact, in that Ensenada place, if I, if I dickered with them long enough, I'd get it for about 10%. Jesus longs for all the facets of our life to be viewed through the cross. Think about it for a moment as you saw that video. If in fact you were carrying a cross, could you think of anything else? And so Jesus is longing for us to see all of our life, all our walk through his cross, through a great sacrifice of love, a sacrifice which he made on our behalf. This passage, my friends, is not really about the law and about how we have fallen short. Of course the cross indicates that. You don't need a cross if we have not fallen short. But it shows far more God's overwhelming compassion, His generosity, and His mercy that such a cross would be borne by the Lord of the universe. Second point. So you go to dinner sometimes, and um, you know, it depends on the restaurant. Sometimes it seems like there's a little bait and switch that kind of hiding things from you, and you order something, and then they say, well, would you like a uh, salad with that? You know, and it's another five bucks or whatever. Or would you like, uh, would you like uh, vegetables with that? And it's another eight dollars. And then, oh, would you like some silverware with that? <laughs> you know, oh, you want water too? Holy cow, you know. And it's almost like you kind of want to, you're going to get a little bit nervous. You go into a place and you say, can you tell me what comes with that? So that I know exactly what's happening. And Jesus then uses this story about an army and a tower. If you build a tower, count the cost so that you can finish. If you have an army and, you're gonna and you have to wage war, protect your people. Count the cost. Have enough men. Have enough resources to be able to do it. What comes with that? We don't just walk blindly in, but God himself counted the cost before the foundations of the earth, knowing that it would require his own son, that he himself would humble himself to take on human form. That's a cost we cannot fathom and yet which has been paid and made on our behalf. You know, there's an old story about a golfer. Gary Player is his name. Many of you will know that name. Some of you will not. He's elderly now and really has pretty much stopped playing. But he won more international golf tournaments than any other golfer in history. And he was typically very gracious, universally very gracious. And so he would uh, be asked by people, oh, I'd give anything to be able to hit a golf ball like you. And normally he, how do you do that? And normally he would say, oh, I'm blessed with God-given gifts or, you know, it's, uh, we're, I'm just really blessed to be able to do that. But he said this one time. He was tired and frustrated. He said this, you would give anything to hit a golf ball the way I do if it were easy. Do you know what you've got to do to hit a golf ball like I do? You've got to get up every morning at 5 o'clock, go on the course, hit 1,000 golf balls. Your hands start bleeding, you walk into the clubhouse, slap a bandage on your hand, and then go hit another thousand balls. That's what it takes. You would give anything to hit a ball like I do if it were easy, but because it's not, you never will. Now have a nice day. <laughs> the, the, the thing that's so interesting about this to me, I, you know, I'm a pastor because I couldn't be anything else. Does that sound, it sounds like a loser, doesn't it? I'm a pastor because I couldn't be anything else. Because I was compelled by God's call to enter into the lives of his people. Because of the brokenness that I have known and the sin which I have been forgiven and the sure and certain knowledge that there is not a one of us much different than that. And so God has called us to come into the lives of broken people. That's who the church is. It's not a country club. It's not a social club. God has called us to come into the lives of people. People, I'm telling you, if we pretend that entering and wading into the, into the midst of brokenness does not bring hurt, we're fooling ourselves. When you wade into brokenness, illness, hurt, that we ourselves have experienced, if we look in the mirror, it's going to come with brokenness and hurt and healing. And healing. For if we don't walk in with the grace of Christ, with the presence of God, if we don't walk into the lives of people, how will people know? 
How will they hear and experience the joy of having someone walk beside them when they have cancer? When they've lost a mother, a father, a child, when they go through an, a teratoma as big as your fist in the middle of their tiny infant daughters, if we don't walk beside in that hurt and that loss, that questioning of God's grace, that it comes with brokenness and with the greatest joy we can experience in this life, I say, I, it may sound insane. It is absolute joy to do what we do. And I pray for what you do. When Jesus says, take up your cross, we're taking his cross into the lives of people, which is our only hope and is our certain opportunity for healing. There is no greater joy when we bring our cross, Jesus' cross, into the lives of preschoolers and into our elementary school into our youth group, when we go to Tijuana, when we do the Salvation Army, when we help people who don't have school supplies or who need a mortgage paid or who are simply lost all hope, we bring Christ into those moments. We, we don't simply bring a happy, happy, joy, joy and pretend that the hurt doesn't happen. We bring the cross and in bringing the cross, we bring the healing which lasts an eternity. It doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't always happen uh, the way we expect, but we bring the healing and hope that it comes. Ministry to a broken world brings brokenness, but it also brings healing. The kind of healing which isn't a Band-Aid, it's not a pill, it is a transformation. There's a story about a young woman named Nancy She's confined to a wheelchair. Her pastor asked her, his pastor asked her how she became crippled. She said, I tried to commit suicide. I hated living alone. I had no friends, hated my job. I was always depressed, so I jumped from a window of her apartment, of my apartment. But instead of being killed, I ended up in the hospital paralyzed. The second night I was in the hospital, Jesus appeared to me and told me that up until then I had a healthy body and a crippled soul. From then on, I would have a crippled body and a healthy soul. I gave my life to Christ right then and there. When I got out of the hospital, I tried to think of how a woman like me could do some good. I came up with an idea. I put an ad in the newspaper that said this, if you are lonely or have a problem, call me. I am in a wheelchair and seldom get out. We can share our problems, just call. I'd love to talk. The results have been astounding. Each week, more than 30 calls come in. Now she spends her days comforting and counseling people. Nancy is a cross bearer. Not her cross, the cross of Christ. A cross which brings healing because of our brokenness. Last point. There's a story, too, about a, a man who asked his two granddaughters what they wanted for Christmas. And they said, give us a world. They were little. We want a world. And he was puzzled by that. And finally, he consulted their mother. And she said, oh, what they want is a globe. They wanted a globe. OK. So that's what he got them. But on Christmas morning, when the presents were open, he could see that they were a little bit disappointed. And one of them said, well, we were hoping it would be a lighted world. Oh, said Grandpa, I can fix that. So he took the globes back to the store and traded them in for ones with lights inside. When he presented these lighted globes to the girl, they were thrilled. Later, he told a friend about this experience and said, I learned something from this experience. I learned that a lighted world costs a whole lot more. <laughs> After this passage, we enter into three of the greatest stories that have ever been told. Jesus is confronted by the religious leaders who says, why do you eat with sinners and welcome them? And Jesus becomes angry again. And he says, I'm going to tell you not one, not two, three parables, three stories about a lost sheep, about a lost coin, and about a lost son. Because that's the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is that we come to seek and to save the lost. Three lost and found stories, only made possible by the cross. The cross which Jesus bore that they might be found and reunited to himself. The cross is not the price we bear or that we pay. It reminds us of our sin but of the price he paid to make us his very own. 
You might remember this, the movie Jurassic Park where the, I forget who he is, the owner of the park, John Houston, I think it was, or someone who says, I spared no expense. I spared no expense. And those are the words of the Father to us. He spared nothing. He emptied himself. He never faltered. For this is not our quest. Building a tower, raising an army, carrying a cross. It is his quest, a reminder of his quest to rescue and redeem you. The cross becomes a thing of beauty instead of a horror and an offense. Not a burden, but rather a moment to remind us that he spared nothing, emptying himself and never faltered along the way. We bear his cross, a cross which he has borne for us to bring us great joy, to walk in his ministry, to walk in his presence, to bring the same joy and words of hope and comfort to everyone who we meet, to bear Christ as we bear that cross. To God be the glory. Amen.